Good morning. It is uh, so good to preach to faces. Last time that I preached was the Good Friday service. We had the lights dim, and I could barely see the camera out there, and so it's good to be able to see people and not have to just look into a camera while uh, opening God's Word with you all. Um, And so if you do have your Bibles, please turn with me to Luke chapter 6. We're going to be continuing in our series on the Gospel of Luke this morning, and we're going to be in verses 12 through 16. And then for those of us who are here this morning, if you're able to do so, please stand as we read God's Word together. Luke 6, 12 through 16. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. This is God's word. You may have a seat as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do pray that as we look at our passage this morning, that we would see your glory, your majesty. As we look at the men that are mentioned in these verses, we would see the mighty things that you accomplished through them. Father, we pray that if we are in here with proud and arrogant hearts, that you would humble us. Father, we pray that if we are in here needing encouragement, that you would encourage our hearts and cause us to rejoice in you. If we are in here this morning and our hearts have yet to respond to the good news of Christ, we pray that you would do that work in our hearts. And Father, ultimately, we pray that as your people hear your word, that we would respond in faith and obedience and and do so with joy, knowing that you are worthy of our praise, of our worship, of our obedience. And yet at the same time, Father, we recognize that we struggle. It is difficult when the, the... desires of our hearts are often at war with the truth of your word, and so we pray that you would help us as we seek to obey your word, as we seek to shine as lights in a world of darkness. We pray for your help in these things, and we pray them all in the name of Christ. Amen. So as we read this morning, our passage deals with the account in which Jesus calls the 12 apostles. And as I was spending time reading and praying and thinking through the passage this week, one of the first things that came to mind was the fact that I'm willing to bet that most of us would consider these men to be great men. They would consider the apostles great men, except for perhaps Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed Jesus. And he's mentioned in this passage as the one who would betray Jesus. Jesus. And and so if we look at these men, the apostles, we see examples in Scripture or descriptions in Scripture of these men being described as men who turned the world upside down, like it says in Acts 17. These were men whose names are written on the foundation of the New Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 21. They are the foundation on which the church was built, like it says in Ephesians chapter 2. And and, and Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. Uh, But we see very clearly in the description that, that Scripture gives of these men that they were great men. And yet, if I asked you before we read the passage, so after we've read it, you might be able to do a little bit better. But if before we read the passage, if I had asked you to name the 12 apostles, how many of you could have named all 12? I think most of us probably 
would have been able to name Peter, James, John. Those are the kind of the popular three. We might have been able to uh, name Thomas because we remember him as doubting Thomas, the one who said he needed to touch and, and see Jesus after his resurrection before he would believe. Uh, we, we, we probably would have remembered Judas Iscariot as the one who betrayed Jesus. But I don't think that many of us could have named more than, than probably about half of the apostles off the top of our heads. Many of us probably, as we were reading the list, didn't even know there was an apostle named Bartholomew. Or that there was another Judas who was not Judas Iscariot, who did not betray Jesus John 14, 22 literally calls this Judas, Judas, and then in parentheses, not Iscariot, to, disting, to distinguish him from the bad Judas. Can you imagine having your name in Scripture, having to have parentheses to separate you from the man who betrayed uh, Jesus? And so this, there was a good Judas, so to speak. But the truth is that we don't know a lot about these men, or at least we don't know as much as we probably should. And in some ways, I, I would say that's okay. There's, there's some of these apostles that Scripture actually doesn't talk much about. Bartholomew, we see his name mentioned in the lists of the apostles, but, but less than a handful of other times in Scripture does his name come up. And, and so there's, there's, the same is true of some of the other apostles. We don't see much information provided about them in scripture and so in some ways it's okay that we don't know a ton about them but at the same time uh, i think you uh, these are men who did indeed turn the world upside down they preached the gospel they established doctrine within the early church they they laid the foundations of the church following christ's death and 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 most of them i would say all except for according to church history, one of them went to their deaths as martyrs for the sake of Christ. And I just want to mention some of the ways in which these men died as they sought to bring the gospel to the nations, as they sought to plant churches and, and strengthen the church. James, he's the, only, he's the only apostle whose death is actually recorded in scripture in Acts chapter 12. Uh, his uh, his death came by the sword. Acts chapter 12 says that he was put to death by the sword. And this most likely refers to the fact that he was beheaded um, under King Herod's reign. And then the deaths of the other apostles are, are, for the most part, widely accepted according to church tradition and church history, but they're not recorded in Scripture. Uh, and yet we see Peter, according to church history, he was crucified upside down in Rome. Matthew suffered martyrdom in Ethiopia. He was also put to death by the sword. John, who is the only apostle who, who lived and died peacefully of old age, he didn't live a very peaceful life. At some point during his ministry, it's, it's widely accepted that he was thrown into a vat of boiling oil because of his faith in Christ. And, and it was only a miracle of God that kept him uh, from death. And then after surviving the oil, John was exiled to the island of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. And, and he's the only one that we, that we know of who died of old age. Bartholomew, he became a missionary to Asia. Uh, and while sharing the gospel in what is now modern day Turkey, he was whipped to death. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross and those who, who were present and, and gave accounts of, of his uh, crucifixion uh, say that he, he was on the cross for two days. They kept him alive on the cross. And during that time, the entire time, he continued to preach Christ to those who were watching. Thomas was stabbed with a spear. Matthias, who was the apostle who would replace Judas after his betrayal of Jesus, he was stoned and then beheaded. And the list goes on and on and on. And as we hear about all the things that these men accomplish and the, the way in which they faithfully live their lives for the glory of Christ and for the advancement of the gospel among the nations, as we see them working to establish and strengthen the church, it should cause us to, in a sense, 
lift these men up, to praise these men for their faithfulness and for all that Christ accomplished through them. Scripture itself even praises, praises and honors these men, and so I think it's good and right to look at these men as heroes of the faith. However, at the same time, it might also surprise you to, to learn how ordinary these men actually were. As I, as I studied this week, and I, you know, I knew some stuff about some of the apostles. I think most of us would understand that Peter, he put his foot in his mouth often. And yet, as I, as I began to look at the lives of these men and look at their ministry as they followed Jesus, as they learned from Christ and were discipled by Christ, we learn that these same men who laid the foundations, who the Bible describes as turning the world upside down, these are the same men who abandoned Christ and fled for their lives at Christ's arrest and crucifixion. These are the same men who struggled time and time again to understand Christ's teaching. And he would often ask them, do you still lack understanding? They struggled with pride as they argued amongst themselves about who would be the greatest among them, who would have the privilege of sitting at Jesus' right hand in the kingdom. And Jesus has to rebuke them for that as well. These are the same men who were rebuked often by Jesus for their lack of, of faith. They didn't come from noble blood. None of them was well known among their people. Many were common fishermen. Simon was a political zealot who, who wanted to overthrow Roman rule. And then on the complete opposite of the spectrum, we have Matthew, who is also called Levi in Scripture. He, he was on the complete opposite of the spectrum. He was a, somebody who was uh, a, considered a traitor by the, the, the Jewish people because he worked for Rome as a tax collector. These two men, they would have hated each other if it was not for Christ. None of these men were famous. None had any religious training whatsoever. No seminary degrees. Nothing. The Bible literally describes these men as uneducated, common men. And so when we, when we think about all the things that these men are described as accomplishing in Scripture, and then yet at the same time when we see other ways in which Scripture describes the apostles, I think it's very fascinating as we look at the apostles because these men are relatable. They're people that we can identify because they weren't chosen by Jesus because they were the best of the best. As a matter of fact, it seems like Jesus was scraping from the bottom of the barrel when he chose these guys. They were common, ordinary men in every sense of the, world, uh, of the word. They struggled like we do. They made mistakes Later on, after Jesus' resurrection in Luke chapter 24, so we'll get there eventually, probably in like five years, with the pace that we've been going through uh, Luke, but in chapter 24, after the resurrection of Christ, he, he describes his dis disciples as foolish ones who are slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. And yet the ministry of these men, so we look at these descriptions, the, at the ordinariness, at the common uh, men that, that we have before us in the passage this morning, and yet their ministry, 2,000 years after these men walked the earth, their ministry continues to impact our world. Not because of some special, hidden ability within them, but because God graciously empowered and used these men to spread the message of the gospel and to turn the world upside down. Ordinary men, people like you and me, became the instruments by which the gospel message was carried to the ends of the earth. And I think that if many church leaders of today's modern day and age, if they had lived during the time of Christ, they would have thought that Christ's selection of these 12 men was ridiculous, absurd. Because so often today, leaders are chosen based on their credentials and on the accomplishments that they have under their belt. And yet these men did not appear to be up for the task. Instead, they are living proof that God's strength makes per, uh, is made perfect in the midst of weakness. 
And so that's, the, that's the, kind of the point that I want to make for you this morning. These men, they weren't special in any particular way. Instead, they were ordinary men in the hands of an extraordinary God. In choosing the twelve, Christ knew what he was doing. Because he knew that the ultimate success of his mission here on earth depended not on the men to whom he chose, but instead on the Holy Spirit working in those men to accomplish his sovereign will. And because of that, it was a work for which God alone deserves praise and glory. The the apostles, they were simply instruments in God's hands, much like we are today as well. And, and as I was preparing for the sermon this week, I, I kept, th- th- there's often a moment in time where you, you, you have way more on your mind than what can go into a sermon, and my mind kept coming back to this passage, and yet at the same time, I was like, I don't know if I have time to go there, but, so I'm not going to work, uh, work through the passage, but my mind just kept coming back to this passage again and again, and so I, I, I feel it's appropriate to read it uh, and to hold it before you as we consider these things is from 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. And there's so much packed in there that I think is appropriate for uh, the the passage that we're looking at today. We're not going to get into it, but I hope that even as I just read that section of Scripture, that that the Spirit begins to work in your heart to to help you see how how that passage relates to what we're talking about this, this morning. Because what we just read in the passage, it's true of us And it was true of the apostles as well. The apostles, they were like the rest of us. They were selected from the unworthy and the unqualified. And I think it's important to remember that because many of us us can become discouraged and disheartened when we look at our lives and we see uh, uh, the suffering that we're experiencing, whether it's sin or failure or, or struggle, and then we begin to think that we are worthless nobodies as a result. And, and in many ways, that's true. Uh, but worthless nobodies are just the kind of people that God uses because that's all he has to work with. Satan may try to convince us that our struggles and shortcomings make us useless to God and to the church, but Christ's choosing of the apostles, it makes it very clear that God can and does work through ordinary men and women, because he himself is an extraordinary God. He used ordinary men to turn the world upside down, not because of any special talents or abilities within them, because God worked in them to do it. And this is why we see time and time again in Scripture that God chooses the humble and the weak so that there's never any question as to who is responsible for accomplishing God's mission in this world. If you've, if you've been a part of Woodridge for any amount of time, or if you've recently started watching our live stream, you've, you've heard over and over again that we are a church that glorifies God by proclaiming the gospel, making disciples, and treasuring Christ above all. This is God's mission on earth. This isn't something that the elders were sitting around one morning and say, hey, you want to come up with a catchy slogan that'll get people in the door? What are you feeling? I'm, I'm feeling proclaimed disciple treasure. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's just throw that out there and, and, and see what happens. The, 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 that mission statement that we, we speak here often, again and again, it comes from Scripture. As we look at Scripture, we see what is the, 
the ultimate purpose of God is to glorify himself. All that he does is for his glory. And then we look in scripture and we see the primary ways in which he accomplishes that is as the gospel goes forth and more people come to worship Christ, to repent of sin and trust in Christ. And then as those people turn from sin and put their faith in Christ, then they begin to grow as disciples. And then as they begin to grow as disciples, they, they, they slowly begin to forsake the things of these, this world, and they begin to treasure Christ more than they treasure past sin, more than they treasure the desires of their heart. This is what they, we see in Scripture. This is what God is doing in this world. He doesn't decide, he, God doesn't leave us to decide how we are going to bring him glory. As a matter of fact, he chooses ordinary men and then he works in them according to his own purposes so that it becomes very clear that he is glorious. And he does it according to his will and his purposes. It's not about you or me. It's about God who works in and through us as his people. One of my favorite examples of this is the account of Gideon from Judges 6 through 8. Uh, we, we see in the passage that um, Gideon is a man who is called by the Lord. He's, he's called to defeat the Midianites who had been oppressing Israel for years. And, and if you just read through the, the, the passage uh, briefly, or if you skim through it, you see very quickly Gideon was not the cream of the crop. He's described as a man who is uh, the weakest man of the weakest clan of the weakest tribe in Israel. The Bible sets him up in such a way that it is very clear that there is absolutely nothing that is extraordinary about this man. He actually is a coward uh, who, who has been called by God to wage war against an army that is at least four times the size of his own. And then we see how God, uh, Gideon responds as God calls him to this. He, he doesn't even immediately respond in faith. Instead, he tests God multiple times to make sure that God can make good on his promise to defeat Midian. This isn't the guy that most of us would choose to lead our army. And yet God continues to work in Gideon. And after Gideon gather, gathers his army of 32,000 men, God throws a curveball, and then he says, that's too many. And even though the odds are already four to one, God dwindles the army down over and over until Gideon is left with 300 men to fight against Midian. Why does God do this? Why does God uh, dwindle the army down? Why does he stack the odds against Gideon and against the Israelites? I think it's very clear as you read the passage is because God wanted to make it very clear that he would be the one who would win the battle. He didn't want to leave Gideon. He didn't want to leave anyone in the army, anyone in Israel with any opportunity to boast that they were the ones who had won the battle. As a matter of fact, he, he doesn't even give them any weapons. Instead, they have pot, some pots and some trumpets to fight against Midian because God is not interested in in exalting man. Instead, he delights to display his power by using weak and common men and women, just like you and me, to accomplish his purposes. And that doesn't mean that we can't recognize men and women that God have used. As a matter of fact, Gideon is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, which is the if you're familiar with it, it's the chapter in Scripture that describes men and women of faith, and it, and it praises them for their, their faith. And, and we look at a lot of those men and women in there, and we, we think, are they worthy to be in there? I, I look at Gideon, and I see how faithless he was through most of his uh, 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 standing against Midian, and yet we see the Bible recognizes some of these men and women. And so uh, even as we look back in, at the apostles, I think it's appropriate to do so. I think it's appropriate to see these men as heroes of the faith. We should applaud their faithfulness. We should applaud them for, for being faithful to the task of laying the foundations of the church. These men, they were the first 
to preach the gospel. They walked faithfully to their deaths, standing in the face of, face of death for the sake of Christ. They did indeed do great things. But as we think about that, it's actually the ordinariness of them. And one of the reasons that I spent so much time describing some of their flaws and some of their mishaps and their struggles and their sins is because it's that, it's that ordinariness within them that makes their accomplishments so amazing. It doesn't cause us to ultimately praise these men, but instead it causes us to praise the God who used them. They became great, not because they were the best of the best, not because they were the cream of the crop. They became great because of the power of the Spirit at work within them. And as we think about that, I think that brings us to some helpful conclusions this morning. Because I anticipate that there's, there's a couple responses that our hearts have as we think about what it looks like in our lives to be used by God. And, and I'm, I'm just going to mention two primary, I'm going to keep it a little bit more broad, mention two primary responses that people might have to being used by God and doing things for God in this world. The first is that some of us, we, we do think that we are the best of the best. These people might see themselves as, as the cream of the crop. They have the leadership skills. They know their Bibles. They can defend sound doctrine at a moment's notice. Or, or at, at very least, they think that they can do these things, and they think that they can do these things well. And all of those things, they're great things, and we should all aim to do so. But at the same time, these people, their hope and their security, it does not lie in God, but in their own giftings and abilities. It's not that they have uh, uh, gifts and abilities, but, but that they use them not to make much of God, but to make much of themselves. And I think this is a lot more common than we might think. This is something that I have to battle against every single time that I get up here to preach. Something in my heart longs for the praise of men. My heart longs for recognition. And I have to fight against the temptation of pride in my speaking ability or my ability to explain things or teach things from God's word. And, and I have to ask myself multiple times, am I up here to exalt myself or am I up here to exalt the name of Christ? Am I up here to display my gifts and talents, or am I up here to make Christ look great? And I see the same struggle in many of you as well. And so the challenge for me and the challenge for those who might struggle in this area to respond when we think about being used by God to, to think that within us there's something special that, that we have to offer to those around us. As we think about that and that struggle, I would challenge those who struggle in that area to consider whether, whether others would look at your life, the things that you say, the way that you carry yourself, and would they say, look at how amazing that person is? Or instead, would they say, what a great God that person serves? How would people describe you as they, as they look at your life? How do you think that they would describe you? And if it's the first way, if, if the way that you conduct yourselves is uh, in such a way that when people look at you, they are drawn to you because of your talents and your abilities and your, your giftings because you love to put those on display for others, I would challenge you to humble yourselves and, and, and to repent of the sin of pride within your heart because the Bible, it warns us against taking this kind of approach. Taking pride in our own abilities and accomplishments. I think King Nebuchadnezzar is one of my favorite examples of this in Scripture. If you want to read along, it's not going to be up on the screen or, or on the, um, the live stream. But Daniel chapter 4 has an amazing description of a man who... who stood before his kingdom and, and praised himself, himself for all that he had accomplished. And we see how God responds to this man. And so in Daniel chapter 4, starting in verse 28, uh, and we're going to read a, a, a big chunk of it all the way through verse 37. I just want you to see how the Lord responds to this kind of person. 
All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power, as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty, while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. At the end of the days, this is at the end of this period that God said it would last, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to de generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and He does according to His will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason re returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me and I was established in my kingdom and, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. And so when we look at this passage, we could, we could say in many ways that Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, was a great man. In many ways we could say that he accomplished great things, and in many other ways he wasn't. But underneath it all, we find a very pivotal truth. There is absolutely no greatness in man that does not bow to the greatness of God. And he will humble the proud. And that's important for us to remember this morning. It's important for me to remember constantly as I stand up here and preach. It's important for you to remember as you use the gifts and abilities that have been given to you by God. And my hope is that for those of us who struggle in this area, and that's, that's myself included, that we would recognize and remember that we are indeed ordinary men and women. And anything within us that is praiseworthy belongs to the God who works in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so if God is convicting your heart this morning of taking pride in yourself, don't just shrug that off. Don't just say that you'll deal with that later, but instead repent to the Lord and humble yourself before him. It is far better to see yourself as you truly are because the more ordinary that you find yourself, the more extraordinary that God becomes in your life. And that leads us into the second response. So the first response that people have often is, is the response of pride, which we just talked about. And the second response is, is kind of the opposite. It's the response of inadequacy. And, I, and I, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about this as well, because I think many Christians, they become discouraged when their spiritual life suffers because of sin or struggle. The reality is that many of us tend to think that we're, we're worthless nobodies when it comes to serving the Lord. And to be honest, in many ways, it's true. Left to ourselves, we have nothing to offer. And I would say this might even be more prominent of a response among many of us than those who respond in pride by thinking that they are amazing somebodies. And so we have the, the people who struggle to think they're worthless nobodies, and we have the people who struggle thinking that they're amazing somebodies. But for the, those who struggle to think that they're nobodies, our own hearts so often attempt to convince us that because of our shortcomings, 
we are left useless to God and to the church. We look around at everyone else, and everybody else looks like they have it all together. And yet we know the struggles that are going on within our own heart. And we become discouraged and disheartened as a result. And, and to that, I, I have a few things that I, I just want to kind of go on a little bit of rabbit trail and encourage those who might struggle in that way as they look around at people and they say, man, why does it seem like I'm the only one who, who doesn't have it all together? So I just have a, a little bit of an encouragement for those people. I've, uh, I, I, if you don't know this about me, I have a master's degree in counseling. And so one of the things, one of my roles here at Woodridge is to do counseling. And, and I've done enough counseling here at Woodridge with people outside of Woodridge. I've, I've counseled couples. I've counseled individuals. And I've done enough of it to know that people are very good and making things look like everything is going well. I've seen marriages that are on the verge of divorce. And yet, if they, those people were to walk in here on Sunday, nobody, absolutely nobody, would have any idea of the struggles that they were facing within their marriage. I've seen people struggling with despair, or with addiction, or with some other sin issue, or some other struggle. And yet, walking into the church on Sunday morning or, or going into their community group or whatever the, the circumstance may be, unless somebody really presses into that person, they would have no clue the struggle that that person is going through. And even if they pressed into that person, I think most of us tend to, to fight to, to keep those struggles to ourselves so that we look outwardly to others like we've got it all together. And so just a quick rabbit trail of encouragement for those who, who might, might look out at the church, look out at other Christians and think that, that within themselves there's this, they, they, they see in their hearts these major struggles and then they look around and they see that everybody else looks like they have it all together. Um, I think we just, we need to stop thinking that we are alone in our weaknesses and struggles. I, I I personally stopped believing a long time ago that I'm the only person who struggles with pride. I'm the only person who struggles in this area or this area. As a matter of fact, when I struggle in a certain area, rather than thinking I'm the only one with a certain struggle, I tend to assume the opposite, that most other people struggle in the same way that I'm struggling or that I do struggle. We see in the Bible... No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And so I struggle to, with pride, and I'm willing to bet most of us in here struggle with pride. I struggle to share the gospel. I'm afraid at times of what other people are going to think of me, and so do the rest of us. I struggle to remain committed and focused in prayer. It's so easy to be spending time in prayer, and within a couple seconds, I'm thinking about my day or thinking about, and guess what? I don't pretend that you don't struggle with that as well. Not, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And so for those of us in here who, who, who look out at the church and they, they think that everybody's got it together, and they're the only ones who are struggling, rather than assuming that, and that we are, only no, but we are the only nobodies in the room as a result, it's much safer to say that we struggle just like everyone else. And some of us might hide it better than others, but we are all sinful humans in need of God's daily grace in our lives. And so that means, what that means is that it's okay for us to recognize our shortcomings because Christ's choice of the, of the apostles, it testifies to the fact that God can and does use the unworthy and the unqualified. These men accomplished great things not because they had extraordinary talents, not because of any unusual intellect within them, not because they had any major political influence, not because of any special status that they might have had in society, not because they were less sinful than everybody else. They accomplished great things because God worked in them to do it. God chooses the humble and the weak so that God's greatness shines through. And the apostles, they were no 
exception to this fact. One of the things I did this week as I was preparing for the sermon is I tried to imagine what it would have been like after each of these apostles. So earlier in the sermon, I, I talked about how many of these men died. And so I was trying to think in my mind what it would have been like for these men to die the deaths that they died for the sake of Christ and enter into the gates of heaven. So there's, you know, some questions that I asked of myself. Did, did they walk through the gates of heaven and all eyes turned on them? Trophies started being brought to them and handed to them for the accomplishments that they made. Did people come and start putting medals around their necks and, 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 and people come and roll out the red carpet in front of them to honor them for the, for the work that they accomplished while they were on earth? Or did they fall down on their face before Christ in worship, along with the rest of God's people? Did they cast all of their accomplishments, their trophies, their medals before the feet of Jesus and cry out along with the rest of the angels and the rest of God's people, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The last part that I, I just uh, read comes from the book of Revelation. So it's a quote from scripture about what it's going to be like. And so I'm going to go with that option over the first option of, of probably what it looked like and, and what will happen for all of us throughout all of eternity as we enter into the glory of Christ. And I'm not saying that these men weren't honored and, and that their faithfulness wasn't recognized. As I said earlier, Revelation, the same book that I just read from about people falling on their face before Christ, worshiping Christ for the work that he accomplished, is the same book that describes these men as having the, their very names written on the foundation of the New Jerusalem. And so it's very clear that these men are recognized to some degree. But if we read the entire book of Revelation in its whole, what do we find? Do we find that the apostles are the hero of the story? No. It's Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain for the sin of the world. He alone is worthy to take and open the scroll. He alone is worthy to receive glory and honor. And so for those of us who struggle with thinking that we are the best of the best, let's stop trying to be the hero. And for those who think that they could never be used by God, if that's where you're at, then, then you need to get over self pit, your self-pity and recognize that God uses men and women just like you to accomplish his purposes. Because our goal is not to display our own greatness, but to display the greatness of God. And so as we, as we begin to kind of wrap things up, Philippians 2, I think it paints such a wonderful picture of what this looks like or what it should look like in our lives. If you uh, turn to Philippians chapter 2, we'll start in verse 5. This is what God's word calls us to in response. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we're going to continue reading in the next couple verses, but I just want to stop right there for a second because we see here that we are called to be humble in the same way that Christ humbled himself. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So we're called to be humble. It's not about us. Ultimately, we follow Christ so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
This is our purpose. And yet, what I find so fascinating about Philippians chapter 2 is that immediately following that section of Scripture, that's the, that's the popular section of Philippians chapter 2. Most of us are familiar with it. But immediately following that section, I find it fascinating what uh, Paul calls us to. He says uh, that we are to shine as lights in the world. We're to be visible people. I want you to read it with me. Starting in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And so if we follow the natural progression of what Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 2, we see we are called to be humble people, we are called to have the same mind that Christ had and humble ourselves. And then we see in the very next section, we are to be lights. We are to be visible. We are to shine for the world to see. And I think when people think about that, we often struggle to find out, okay, if I'm supposed to be humble, why am I supposed to be so visible? And, and how, does, how do those things work together. And, and part of it, I think, has to do with the fact that we don't understand what humility is. And so uh, it's just a quick point that I want to make because humility is not invisibility. I think many of us have this idea that to be humble means, oh, take your eyes off me. Don't look at me. Don't, don't do this. You know, don't recognize anything uh, about me. If I'm, if I'm a gifted uh, uh, musician and somebody comes up to me and says, hey, you're, you're pretty good at musician, you know. Oh, no, I'm not. I, you know, don't, don't say that. Uh, you know, that, that's not humility. Humility is not invisibility. The Bible doesn't call us to shrink back from the world, but to go into the world so that the world can see this is humility, not the majesty of ourselves, but the majesty of God at work in such ordinary people. And so going back to the musician illustration, humility doesn't say, no, I'm not, and deny the gifts that God has given us. Humility points that person to the one who has given us the ability. This is why I think Philippians 2 follows right after that section on humility with this uh, beckoning of God's people to shine bright as lights in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation because what humility does is it is it takes the glory of Christ and then it begins to reflect that light to those around us so that when people look at us they don't see the greatness that is found within us but instead they see the greatness of the God at work within us and so we are called as Christians to be visible people. We're called to shine as lights in the world, but we are not shining our own light. Instead, we are reflecting the glorious light of our Savior to a world of utter darkness. And in the end, no one will have any reason to boast in us, but instead will boast in the one whose light has overcome the darkness. As we read our passage this morning, we looked at the list of the names of these men, these apostles. They were an example of this. These were ordinary men being used by an extraordinary God. And in the end, we do not look to them and give them all praise and glory and majesty for the work that they accomplished. We look to the God who worked in such ordinary people for his purposes and for his glory. And that encourages hopefully, our own hearts as well. As we look at our lives and we see, man, I am struggling with sin. I am suffering in this way. How could God ever use me? We see very clearly that he uses people just like you and me. And so the apostles, they were an example of this ordinary men being used by an extraordinary God, and the same God who worked in them works in us for the sake of his glory. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you that you are amazing and that you use creatures like us to display that splendor and majesty to the world around us. Father, teach us to not take that lightly. For those of us who struggle with pride, Father, teach us not to use the gifts and abilities that you have given us for the exaltation of self, but instead to use it to, to make much of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, for those of us who struggle to say, there is nothing within me that God could ever use. Those of us who are overcome by the temptations and sins and discouraged by the, the, the failures that we... Uh, that, that we go through and experience in our lives. Father, encourage our hearts. Show us it's not about us. It's not about us getting to a place where we can present ourselves to God in such a way that he can now begin to use us. Help us to respond in faith and say, God, I know that I am broken and unworthy, but you are worthy and you are able. Use me for your purposes and according to your will. Father, if there's anybody who is not trusting in Christ, we pray that they would see there is nothing good within them, that you would humble them, that you would help them to see the light of Christ, and that you would be glorified as, as you work in your people's lives and as you work in those who have yet to trust in Christ. Father, encourage our hearts. Help us to be obedient to your word. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.